chiropractor for Sierra Club, Maine. And uh, in general, I have 10 plus years in various experiences, one of those being communications. Um, so I've written a number of LTEs op-eds in my day. And so Matt asked if I would come and just uh, say a couple words about some advice on what makes a good LTE and op-ed. I also just invite Bob to chime in at any point. Bob Howe is our lobbyist for the chapter. Um, and he also has written a number himself. But um, what I'm gonna do first is uh, actually share my screen. And can everybody see this uh, document? What is a letter to the editor? Yes. Okay. And I can't see everybody when I share my screen. So feel this is informal. Feel free to just shout out if you'd like. Um, don't worry about taking a lot of notes with this. I'm going to be going through these two like how to documents. Um, we will be mailing, we'll be emailing them out to everybody uh, right after. So you'll have them for you to take a look at. But first, just what is an LTE? We hear LTE all the time. So LTE is letter to the editor, very simple. Um, but it's usually written in response to an article, editorial op ed, or a column that has been published. Um, typically, you see it a lot when someone uh, maybe has a different point that maybe needs to be dis dis uh, considered for an article that wasn't mentioned, a, a disagreement, whatever it may be. Um, but what's nice about them is they can be written by anybody. Uh, so it's a really good opportunity for constituents, whoever it may be, uh, just general members of the public to step up and say, wait a minute, here is something I think you need to consider that hasn't been considered with this article that was published. Um, they're published on the editorial page, which is one of the most read pages in any publication. Um, so it's a great way to reach a bunch of folks. Um, and due to space limitations in newspapers, not all LTEs are published. But what's really important to know is the more LTEs that a publication receives on a certain subject, the more likely they are to publish at least one of those. So a lot of times at the CR Club, we'll say, we need to start pushing LTEs on, cert, on um, consumer owned utility bill, whatever it may be. Um, and the hope is that at least one of those will get published because they, the publication will then know this is really important for us to be sharing out. Um, and LTEs are more likely than op-ed to be published and often in a much faster turnaround time. Um, now with the digital world, you know, op-eds do get, can be published really quickly. I just submitted an op-ed a couple weeks ago on a Friday and it was published on a Saturday, um, but I'm not sure how frequent that actually does happen. LTEs are much faster and they're much shorter, so they're easy, easier to fit in. Any questions so far? All right, so things to consider when you're thinking about writing an LTE. Um, your topic has been mentioned in the publication recently. So you want to make sure that it is, it's time sensitive. If there's something relevant, there's some sort of relevancy of why you're writing it. Um, you have just one or two points that be, can, can be succinctly stated. So LTEs, like we'll, we'll share in a minute, are much, much shorter than op-eds. So you don't want to be writing something where you need to write five, six, seven points and squeeze it into small character limits. This is something you have one or two points at most that you want to get across to your reader. Um, and you can write your, your response to the topic within one or two days. Again, these are really timely. You don't want to be writing a response, you know, two or three weeks after it's already been published. It's too late at that point. LTEs are much faster turnaround times and you want to make sure that you're getting it to out to the publication as fast as possible. Um, so we have this document for op-eds as well. I'm gonna go into line by line for the LTE. I'm not gonna do that for the op-ed except for in their differences because there are a lot of similarities. Um, but the number one thing that I like to tell people about LTEs and op-eds is follow the publication's rules. So what you wanna do is when you're considering writing an LTE, you want to go on, so whether it's the Bangor Daily News, the Portland Press Herald, the Forecaster, whatever it is, you want to go on the website, you want to search like letter to the editor and the publication's name, and right what you will find is that each publication has slightly different rules as to what they accept for LTEs, and a lot of those are around 
um, the word limits. So what we found is that on average, pieces, uh, a lot of publications limited their LTE pieces to 250 words. So that's a couple paragraphs, it's not long. Um, and Matt's gonna be sharing an LTE that we found just for folks to take a look at. Um, but when we think back above and we say, you wanna make sure your points are succinct, just one or two points, that's because you really don't have much space. Uh, know your goal and your audience. If you want them to take action, ask for it. If you want change, demand it. You wanna make sure that you're very clear um, with the solutions or problems that you are identifying and that you, you have some sort of, what's the reason for your point? Do you want them to learn something? Do you want them to take action? Whatever it may be, whatever your goal is, you wanna make sure you know that going into it. Um, also try to hook the reader. This is a little bit harder with LTEs because they're so short, but if you're able to start with something compelling, um, a story, whatever it may be, that's a really good idea to draw the reader in. Of course, limitations being the amount of words that you have. Um, again, you wanna stay focused. There isn't a lot of space. So you don't wanna have 20 things that you need to be discussing in 250 words because everything's just gonna become lost and the likelihood of it even being published will be very small. Um, you wanna make sure that you have one or two points for your LTE that you wanna get across um, and that you know your goal and it's clear. Uh, use everyday language. Uh, don't limit your audience by using complex language. I don't know about you, but when I'm interested in reading about something, and it's nothing but acronyms, these really big words that are really technical, and I'm not very familiar on the subject, I, I don't keep reading. It's, I don't understand it. I shouldn't need a dictionary or to be able to Google thing terminology to be able to understand it. And in general, you should be writing at an eighth grade level or below. So you don't, this is not the place to show people how smart you are by how many big words that you know. <laughs> you wanna make sure that you are reaching a really broad audience. And one way to do that is to not use complex language. Um, on a similar note, assume nothing. Don't assume that your readers are informed on your topic. Um, give them a little background before going into an issue, something that kind of just catches them up. Um, and also, if you're writing about something complex, maybe state why you uh, they should be listening to you do you have a credential in whatever it may be or if you're writing about energy use and you have some energy credential you might want to share that so people know that he, hey i know a lot about the subject and this is why you should be listening to me um maintain composure so it's okay if you read something an article and think oh this is outrageous and i just have to write a response to this this is ridiculous you can uh, be upset, but never personally attack someone and just make sure you're maintaining composure. Focus on the policy or the idea and propose a better alternative. Never, ever, ever personally attack someone. Uh, it doesn't, it's not good for your cause and it's, it's not good for anybody. Uh, again, I mentioned this previously, but staying relevant, wanna make sure you're writing about something that's timely um, you don't want to be writing about something that happened months ago, and we don't want folks to waste their time. And if, if you are doing that, the chances of your LTE being published are going to be minimal. So we want to make sure you have the best chance of getting it published. Um, and also find a local angle. So say you want to write about climate change. Write about something that's happening here in the state right now that's a, that climate change is affecting, whether it be ocean acidification or whatever it may be in affecting our, our water sources. Um, you know, last year I wrote, I wrote an op-ed, but I did mention all of the, um, the droughts that we we're having, this, these historic droughts, and that was, and I named the specific towns that those were happening in. Um, so those are just some ideas. And I, I can see that chat, like people are chatting, but it's, it's something relevant to me. I can't like see the box. So just like chime in if I need to know. Um, also keep it you, be authentic. Don't try to write like somebody else. Just, you know, be a genuine person. Um, tell your personal story, as I mentioned, and, uh, you know, include information on who you are, your title, um, anything that can really help your argument. B 
the factual uh, and highlight of the issues that haven't previously been addressed. So make sure you're including facts to back yourself up. And one of the things that I also think is one of the most important things for you to do is link your sources. I always say, if you're gonna be including facts, you should never include a fact that you don't have a source that you can link it to because it does, it really helps one, continue to educate the reader, but provide evidence that what you're saying is true. And this is why that they should be listening to you. Uh, avoid duplicate letters. Don't say, send the same letter uh, to two papers. So what you wanna do is send one letter. Uh, if they don't respond, usually it will say, you'll hear back from us in a certain time period, or when you send it, you can ask, please let me know by Wednesday or I'll send this to another publication, whatever it may be. Um, when I sent my op-ed to the Press Herald recently, they responded and said, yes, we're interested in publishing this. We'll get back to you later today. Like they gave me some sort of notice, but once you know that the first publication is not going to be, going to be actually publishing your piece, then send it on to the other sources that you're interested in having it be, being sent, uh, published in. Um, send a polished piece. You do not want to send a Google Doc that has all sorts of track changes in it. You want it to be the final piece. Um, you want it to be an attached Word document. You don't want it to be a PDF because you need them to be able to get in there and make changes if they want to make some tweaks. And I can talk about my experience with my last op-ed. Um, you want it to be double spaced. You want to provide a title. If you have an image that you you say that they can use, um, this is more relevant for op-eds. We're welcome to submit that as well. No guaranteeing that they'll use it, but, the, but publications are always looking for images with their work. Um, and you want to make sure you include all your contact information. If you have, if you're writing from, um, because of an organization you're part of, you should write the organization, you should write your title, um, email, phone number, address, um, so they have all of that information on hand. Uh, and then very, very important that you thank them. So even if they don't publish it, thank them for considering it. Thank them for getting back to you. It's really, I always like folks to know they really appreciate them giving some sort of response. And if they do publish it, thank them. It's really great um, that they would publish it. And you wanna make sure that they, they, they know that you appreciate them getting the word out. Um, and then speaking of spreading the word, once you get your piece published, share it. You want to make sure you're you're publishing this piece because you want people to read it. And one way that you can get people to read it is to share it on social media. Send it to your legislator if it's something that you think they should be reading um, or any other relevant decision makers so that folks know that, look, I've, I've submitted this LTE. Here's why you should be reading this. Um, it's really important. Um, I also included some things about writing LTEs on behalf of Sierra Club Maine. We would absolutely love it if folks were interested in doing that. Um, we just like to ask that you identify yourself as you know, volunteer for Sierra Club Maine, whatever your role might be, and then submit it to us with at least 24 hours notice, Monday through Friday, um, and at our main.chapter.sierraclub.org. And we'll take a look at it and get back to you and work with you on it. Um, yeah, so that's LTEs. Any questions? I went through that pretty quickly. And similarly, Sarah, because um, we do some things for testimony for legislative bills, you can always write as an individual. Um, and that is definitely what most people do. So the last port portion was just if you want to write on behalf of Sierra Club. Yeah. And Bob, anything you would add? Not much. That was very thorough, Sarah. Excellent. Um, but I would uh, reinforce the notion that letters to the editor are usually in response to an article that's appeared in the paper. Occasionally, I've seen a paper print a letter from somebody complaining that something was not being given coverage, um, and and that that may be a, a certainly appropriate way to bring that to the paper's attention. Really important to follow the paper's direction, starting with word limit and any other guidance they have. If you have an expert, some expertise on the issue you're writing about, um, make note of that. Maybe you're a, a doctor writing about health care issues or a Prius owner writing about hybrids or 
you're writing about renewable energy and you have solar panels on your roof, you might want to mention those things. If your ultimate goal is to try to get an elected official or a company to do something, uh, you ought to name them in the letter. Um, that way, staff or we don't have a lot of staff from main legislators, but they may see that or um, the company, uh, a lot of corporations will review uh, the opinion pages and um, th that way it'll come to their attention. Um, and it is, it is important to um, include your contact information. My experience a newspaper will often call and just confirm that I'm who I am and uh, you still want this published. And so if they can't reach you, they may not, they may not read it, uh, publish it. I think those are the only things I would add. Awesome. And Matt, do you want to, do we want to share the example of the LTE that we saw now, or do you want to do that at the end? Um, we could, if that, if that's helpful, just to get a quick view of what one looks like. Do you have it? Like, do you want to share your screen? I do have it up right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. And it is short. Um, and this, actually, we can send, I can put the link in the chat, too. Can I do these two things at once? I think so. Um, so this one, there's, I, I just picked one that was timely and relevant, and it did have a lot of the things that Sarah was talking about. Um, and we can definitely analyze this further. I'm sure there's ways that this could have been improved as well, but um, it is short. So I'm happy to just read this if that's what, what we would like, or we can just read it together silently. Yeah, what I like about this one is um, like, I don't know about you, but have you been hearing a lot in the news about offshore wind and lobstermen? Like I've been here, it's been, all over my social media. Every time I feel like I open up um, the homepage to um, the Press Herald or BDN, whatever it may be, there's a story about lobstermen protesting that offshore wind project from New England off Aventus. So this person is in, what they're writing is that they disagree with um, the lobstermen's obser uh, um, opposition to the project and here's why. Um, and so it's very timely. It's short, like we talked about, it links to studies. It has uh, you know, one to two points that they're not considering. Um, so if you think of all the things that we talked about, it does hit on a number of those aspects. Yeah. Yep, I thought it was short. Um... I mean, it was succinct and I, I definitely appreciate this. I found this article really interesting and obviously the Nature Journal is a very widely known and respected journal. Um, yeah, it was timely, it was relevant and I think it was pretty good. Um, and I just, so I just wanna... asked in the chat, this is Becky. Um, I just asked in the chat, did they, did he supply the link or did the paper add the link? Um, it's hard to know. I always put the links in myself. So when I send them an article, I've linked everything. So they may have linked it for him if he hadn't, but you want to make it as easy as possible for the publisher. So if you reference it, you should find that link and put it in your document. Um, when I go through the uh, one that I submitted for the on the fracked gas line that we stopped, woohoo! Um, I will point out that like all these links and there's lots of links. Those are all links that I found um, and put in there myself. I also wanna point out that Jonathan Fulford, our legislative um, volunteer team leader mentioned, it's really helpful to have people read it for you. I never submit anything without having at least one or two eyes on it. Um, so, so important, read it out loud, whatever you gotta do to make sure that it makes sense. Um, my last op-ed article that I'm going to show, I sent it to, I don't know, three, three or four people maybe. I had Matt look at it. I was like, there was something I was including in there that was techno, like a more advanced from my knowledge when it came to gas. And I was like, Matt, does this make sense? You know, like I'm making sure that my facts are, are accurate and doing 
and making sure that I'm pulling in the right people to help me with it. All right, so I guess we can move on to off ed. So again, um, we have another, let me show my screen. We'll send this along. Um, can folks see the op ed document now? Yeah. All right. So I'm not going to go through quite in detail. I'm just going to point out the differences. But what is an op ed? Op ed stands for opposite editorial. Um, and there are articles devoted to commentary, feature articles, and opinions. Um, not all op-eds are published because of the space, um, but you want to make sure that it's very relevant. You don't, again, just like an LTE, you don't want to be sending something that's totally out of the blue um, and not relevant to anybody. Uh, you want to make sure, again, just like an LTE, the more op-eds they receive on a certain subject, the more likely they are to publish at least one of them. Um, and op-eds are approved by the editorial page or opinion page editor and will also be cleared by a copy editor. So there's a little bit more um, going on when it comes to an op-ed in terms of a review process. And when I show my op-ed, I'm gonna talk about the process I went through to get it published in the Press Herald just for, uh, as one, one idea. Um, so when do you know if it's a good idea to write an op-ed? Just like with an LTE, you wanna make sure your topic is timely and relevant your topic will be of interest to a wide audience. So because there is more space that you're taking up in the publication, publications don't really wanna publish something unless it's gonna be of interest to a large group of people. Um, you have important information to share in a new and interesting way. So whether it be a story, um, we think about the fact that the LTE was one or two points of information. This is a, you have, um, much more space in, in op-eds. So you have more ability to write uh, information that might be new or share it in an interesting way. And you are unable to write your piece in 250 words or less. So thinking about the LTE, if you really need much more space, then op-ed is where you want to be focusing your attention. Um, just like with an LTE, you want to make sure you're following the publication's rules. Um, many publications limit pieces to 750 words or less. I did a little bit of research. I think the Bangor Daily News is 750 words. I think the Press Herald is less. I think it's 650 words. So when you go into it, again, look it up online, see how many words that they are. And if you know going into it, say, I want it to be published here, then read that article first. Um, one thing that I had to consider is when I first pitched mine to the Press Herald, um, I went with the one that was shorter content and then I identified content that I would I was I would be able to add back if I was going to be submitting it to the Bangor Daily News at some point. Um, you know, just like everything else, know your audience, hook your readers, stay relevant, everyday language, uh, link. Oops, for me to make that. Uh, link your sources, which Becky asked about, I'll show you mine, be factual, um, maintain composure. A lot of these are very, this, very much the same. Um, and again, we do love to have volunteers who might be interested in writing op-eds on behalf of the chapter, um, identifying who you are and submitting it to us 24 hours ahead of time. Um, I'm going to go to share my op-ed, but before I do that, Bob, what else would you add? Not much if I don't unmute. <laughs> um, so one observation I'd make about op-eds is that the distinction between a letter to the editor and an op-ed isn't, isn't a bright line necessarily. <clears throat> um, I've seen um, papers print an op-ed that, that actually was in response to something else, which is usually what you think of as an LTE, but I think the difference in these cases may be, and this I would say applies generally to op-eds, that the paper understands that you have a certain expertise in the subject um, that maybe the letter writer doesn't have, and therefore your thoughts warrant a little more attention, a little more space in the, in the paper. 
Uh, you want to be sure that you take a stand on an issue for or against. Um, you want to hook your readers um, with, uh, <clears throat> with an idea right up at the beginning. Um, maybe a brief anecdote would, would do that. Um, you want to support your thesis with some evidence and demonstrate that, in fact, you do have some ex expertise in the uh, subject matter, but you don't want to sound like a professor. Don't need and don't want a lot of fancy technical language. Um, I think it's important that you acknowledge uh, opposing arguments. Um, this is something I do as a lobbyist as well. I, I never want to have legislators only find out there are opposing arguments from somebody else. They're gonna think, well, why didn't Howe tell me about this? I think the same is true as an op-ed and it doesn't hurt to acknowledge that there may be some valid arguments on the other side, but to the extent there aren't, you wanna refute those. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, I, I, you want to end the op-ed with, with some call to action. Um, all right, so you've read my op-ed. Here's what I want you to do about it. And I think that's it. Awesome, great. Um, so we'll, we can send this out to everybody. It's kind of long, so we won't read it in full, but um, I, if, if anyone doesn't know, uh, Summit Gas was thinking about expanding their frack gas line from Belfast to Thomaston. Um, we, with like this large grassroots effort, were able to get them to stop it. Um, there were a number of articles that came out in response to this effort, um, but I was really frustrated reading them because uh, for two reasons. One, I felt like none of the articles really um shared how much this was a grassroots effort in that like the power of people coming together to make this to stop this um so that was one of my goals like i wanted to share that this really was a grassroots root success the other thing that i found really frustrating was because the articles were written in response to summit gases um press release they really got to control the narrative and what they shared was that this was a huge loss to the community and here are the reasons why. So the other point I wanted to get across was like, no, this isn't a loss to the community. This is a, a huge success and here are the reasons why. So I was refuting and I, I link in my article um, what they had said. So what I ended up doing was, uh, like I mentioned, I submitted this to the Press Herald. Um, I submitted it on a Friday morning, they got back to me um, by around noon, and we had a number of back and forth. So one of the things that um, they had highlighted was that in my article, I mentioned that this, I, we refer to gas as fracked gas. That's a very purposeful thing. We do not refer to it to natural gas because as Becky likes to say, there's nothing natural about natural gas. The whole process of getting it out of the ground with chemicals and contaminating the earth is not natural. So we always call it fracked gas. However, what the, um, uh, the person who runs the editorial page for the, for the Press Herald had said was, every time they ask Summit Natural Gas if their gas is fracked, they said, there's no way of knowing. And the reason why they say there's no way of knowing is because um, even though the majority of gas is fracked, it all is sort of pooled together, they purchase it and there's no way for them to be able to say this percent of our gas is fracked. And they do that on purpose. Um, it's kind of like this way for them to be able to hide from the truth. So one of the things we had back and forth was the my use of the word fracked instead of natural or just gas. And so they actually asked me to add content to my letter to be able to support my argument that the majority of gas is fracked. Um, and that put it way above the 650 uh, word limit, but it was worth it to them because they wanted to protect themselves as a publisher so that Summit couldn't come back to them and say, wait a minute, you're, you're spreading false information. And again, we shared that 
um, the link that I had in this article. So, um, so thinking about my article, um, I mentioned that the announcement is for, for uh, to stop the frack gas pipeline is a win for our health, planet, and economy, and a testament to community organizing. So, like those are the two things that I'm covering. It's it's a good thing, and um, it's really a testament to the importance of community organizing. I then normally I would start with a personal tidbit. I did this in a BDN op-ed I had in the fall where I talked about how much Maine has. I grew up in Maine. How much Maine has changed in the environment and climate change. Um, but I talked about being from mid coast. Like I am a resident here. I grew up here, and this is why it's really important to me. Um, I talk about the work that. Sierra Club, the role that Sierra Club had in all this ro robust grassroots effort. I linked to our add up campaign, which is a petition that had 280 signatures. I linked to an article um, in the, was it the Knox Village Soup that talked about all the people who came to the event. I quoted um, one of those grassroots folks to talk, okay, this is a grassroots effort, so it's important for me that I talk about one of those grassroots volunteers and what it meant to her. And then I go into how their, some of the National Gas's letter announcing their decision misled readers into thinking it would be a loss for the community. And here's why. And this is, I don't know if you guys can, can you see when I highlight? So this is the section, the piece that um, the Press Herald asked me to add. So it's, again, it's really hard to figure out how much gas is fracked, but what we were able to figure out is that shale gas accounted for 75% of total gas in the United States. And here's the link. According to the Federal Energy Information Administration, shale gas is all fracked. So we can at least decipher that 75% of, of gas is fracked at least. Um, and I linked it. I talk about how bad it is for the environment, link to a study, link to another study. Um, for it's bad for our health, link, I linked it to a study. It's, uh, you know, 80, uh, it produces, you know, methane, which is 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide, link to a study. It's just throughout this whole thing, I have all these links and, you know, it's not even the cheapest heating option. Here's why, here's the study that shows that Frack gas is not as cheap as people say it is. Um, and then I talk about other alternatives and thinking about how, um, you know, if we really care about the environment, we shouldn't be thinking about gas as a bridge fuel because that's ridiculous and that doesn't exist. <laughs> but instead we should be thinking about other incentives to get people to upgrade to heat pumps. And I wanted people to know about the green bank that we're working on. on. And then I just circled it back to the fact that this again was this great testament to community organizing and that like when we come together, we can make anything happen. Um, so this was my article. They published it that Saturday morning, but there wasn't, I was, you know, going back and forth on the phone with them until, I don't know, five or six o'clock. I, I looked to Matt because Matt was helping me until five or six o'clock that Friday afternoon. Um, so that might, you might run into a scenario like that as well. And we can send the link to this article if you'd like to read it in detail. Any questions about that? Yeah, and I just mentioned in the chat, um, for those of you who have gone through your free subscriptions or don't have one, we can send the PDF to that article. Um, and I just have a quick question. Did they, did they add that picture of fracking on the side? Did yes. you see the, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, really interesting to talk to the woman from the Press Herald because uh, it was clear in talking with her, unlike other publishers I've spoken to, that she was she was an advocate for us. Like she really wanted to make this work, so she was she was like helping me find things, and, and it was it was a, it was a really good experience. Um, oh, the one other thing I ran into though was that Press Herald, in addition to other. Um, publications have a limit on how frequently you can publish op-eds. And so I actually was in that time frame. Um, I had forgotten that I, with our uh, fight against the corridor, I had added my name to an op-ed that was published with some other environmental groups. But because 
um, I was that letter was submitted as a group. And this one was so personal, it had to come from me, it couldn't have come from Matt because I had my personal story. Um, they made an exception and they published it within a uh, two articles within 90 days. So um, thinking about that as well, if you publish something in the Press Herald, and it was only 30 days ago, you should look to publish something somewhere else. Becky, did you want to add something? I just want to ask a question because I've been increasingly frustrated. Um, and I don't know if this is worth writing an op-ed about, but it, you know, in almost every case, whether we're looking at um, the CMP corridor or this, this gas situation or Nordic Aquafarm or Nestle, the papers, particularly I read the Press Herald more than I read the Bangor Daily, but um, they will take the piece that the company provides and the bulk of the article and you know is from the perspective of the company and they don't do the due diligence as far as I'm concerned of you know reaching out to the opponents in any way and I feel like it's really not balanced reporting and I have been feeling like I want to write you know, um, and, you know, copy those articles. That's so frustrating to me that we could have 280 people, you know, do add up or 198 people showing up in Rockland and the article was all summit gas information, you know, and I just feel like, you know, we should be telling the paper they are not doing a good, their due diligence on their reporting. And, but, you know, is that, I mean, is that like, is that not a good thing? I mean, it's been going around in my brain for a while. I'm just wondering if that would be worthwhile writing. So um, I can share a little bit. Uh, I, I probably can back up and share a little bit more about how I came to this piece too, because I did experience a little bit of that. And then I'd also love to hear Bob's thoughts as well. Um, but there were all these articles that were coming out in response to Summit pulling back and not continuing with their project. By the way, I apologize if you can hear my dog snoring in the background, <laughs> it might be distracting, I'm not sure. You okay, good. Um, so uh, I had actually, the Press Herald had reached out to me in response to Summit's plan. It was before it had announced, they told me in confidence it was happening, although thanks to our uh, very involved volunteers. <laughs> I had heard through the grapevine that it was happening. And so they asked for comment and, um, I gave, you know, I gave them like, I don't know, eight to 10 quotes that like were spot on really talked about a lot of what I was expressing in this, in this op-ed and they didn't use any of them, um, when they initially published it. So I reached back out to the uh, reporter and I said, Hey, you know, I saw the piece. I'm sure you're still working on it. Um, would there be an opportunity for you to add some of the conversation that we had? And he did respond and say, yes, it's still a work in progress. We wanted to get it out by noon. Well, they wanted to be the first ones to release. And this goes back to, um, you know, they, they want to be the first ones to get the story and the fact that Summit did really control that narrative. And so he did eventually add um, some of, like, I think maybe one quote of mine. But reporters really do they want it to be easy um so the fact that summit provided this really robust press release that laid out all these reasons they just wanted to copy and paste and put it put it into public size so so while like on our end we also released a counter press release about the situation we didn't see a lot of that get used because the main story was summit pulling back and so when I approached this op-ed, what I wanted to really talk about was, was Summit misleading the pu public. So I didn't wanna make it against the reporters because this is a small state and I want reporters to be our, all of our friends. Um, but what I said is that this is Summit's fault. Like, I don't care about Summit being our friends. They're not our friends. Um, this is Summit's fault. And so I'm going to put the blame on them for misleading the public and, you know, our reporters, whoever it may be. And here are the true facts. So that's that's the way I approached it. I don't know, Bob, what would you add to that? With respect to why didn't you use any of my quotes? No, um, Becky's original question was, you know, she's so frustrated with the fact that 
you know, all these publications are just are just continuing Summit's narrative and they're not getting the, the you know, our feedback or anybody else's sort of evidence that it's not a good thing. Well, I, I, Summit made it as easy as possible for papers to pick up their press release. And I think one just has to do the same on the other side by giving them information, getting in front of them so they don't have to do a lot of their own research um, and hope for the best. I would question though, um, like my gut feeling to Becky's point is that I wouldn't try and get a letter to the editor published complaining about the, the <laughs> papers are editorial policies. But on the other hand, I do think maybe there's room for, as a subscriber, I'm not a subscriber, but as a subscriber, Becky, saying, hey, I'm really disappointed with the way you're covering these issues. I'd like to see you as a customer who is paying you. I want to see you do better. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. I think like as Sierra Club Maine, because we want to be friends with all these reporters and want them on our side, it's really hard for us to say, like accuse people of, of doing these Wouldn't things. Wouldn't do it at Sierra Club Maine, that's right. Sure. But if we can get other people, readers of the publication, just the, the their, their, um, their audience to say, look, this isn't, we want to see more balanced reporting that probably be a lot more effective and go a long way. Mm -hmm. Well, and, uh, Sarah, I think when you talked to that reporter and said, gee, is there a way you can use some of what we talked about? You were very gently chiding them for not doing that without calling anybody a bad name. Mm -hmm. So that right, yeah. sort of persistence um, helps, pays off sometimes.